This first winter sociable plover was found in Suffolk on the 22nd of October and was usually seen distantly with the lapwing flocks. On the 24th of October, the day of the big blue robin dip, the bird was showing distantly on Minsmere levels, making it one of the most watched birds this year. This species has now occurred in Britain about 40 times with a distinct increase in records since the 1970s. This is somewhat at odds with their position on the breeding grounds, where there has been a steady decline. It remains to be seen if the continued ploughing up of their breeding steps causes a decline in records here. After feeding in the company of Widgeon, the bird flew off south with lapwings shortly after midday. Even with several recent records, this little swift attracted the biggest crowds of the spring. Found on a Saturday morning, it delighted birders for four days until the 29th of May. Being only the 15th record for Britain, it was easily the most twitchable bird ever. As usual, I have slowed the flight down to give watchable views of this extremely fast flyer. On several occasions it was seen to be bullied by the larger common swifts.
as well as giving ultra close flight views as it weaved between birders assembled near the river bridge, it also gave the first ever views of a little swift roosting in Britain. Many people made a second visit to see the bird roosting on the side of the railway bridge. Typically for this species it went to roost early and left late so the best views were obtained just before it emerged at about 8.15 in the morning. This Isabelline wheat ear, which had been ringed at Landguard on the 21st of September, proved to be a short stayer and was only seen on the one day. Fortunately, it performed well on the southern part of the common, right up until dusk, so that many people were able to see it. The very upright stance and short tail were obvious features at times, but the dark alula was not visible on the closed wing. Apparently the presence of a dark alula had been noted in the hand. Other features to look out for include the tail pattern, which is almost like desert wheat here, the whitish underwing coverts and long legs and bill. Some of these features can be seen well as the bird fends off an attack by a northern wheat ear. Also found on the 21st of September, this adult redneck stint attracted large crowds over the weekend of the 22nd and 23rd. This was only the sixth record for Britain, with the last twitchable mainland bird being back in 1995. It was also the first to be found far inland, sharing the flooded field with up to 12 little stints, several curlew sandpipers and many dunlin. In spite of being the latest by three weeks, this bird was still in mainly summer plumage with an extensive red bib.
The rather colourful scapulars and contrasting pale grey wing coverts are also unique to redneck stint. At a range of about 200 yards, a high magnification was needed to record these shots of this tiny bird. Note the white tips on the underside of the tail feathers of this juvenile Palliser's grasshopper warbler. Remarkably, this bird was twitchable for three days on Blakeney Point and often gave good but brief views in the open like this. This green heron was only the second twitchable record in Britain. Being 19 years after the first, it was much appreciated by hordes of eager twitchers over its nine day stay. This bird was a first winter, unlike the adult of 1982. Amazingly, both records were in the Humberside area. After its initial discovery on an open area of Cut Reed, the bird resorted to clambering about in the waterside trees, making observation very difficult at times. Note the stripes down the neck and the spotted wing coverts of this immature bird. Oh, yeah, I mean, I got 
thought so about Anabok. Yeah, yeah. 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 Notice the bird's habit of repeatedly flicking its short tail. Going back around here, just in case. Just in the vein, how it might. Come back around there. Mm -hmm. I don't think it will. No, it was settled in there. It's just sort of. Not been a lot. A record shot photo, man. Mainland records of bobolink are very rare in Britain, so this bird near Prawl Point was a big attraction during its seven day stay. As this species has the longest migration of any North American passerine, its occurrences in Britain are considered not to be ship assisted. Indeed, more than half of the 20 plus records have been on the Isles of Scilly and all have been between mid-September and mid-October.
it's been here, Alan. Yeah. As usual, this bird was a first winter, showing tapered ends to the pointed tail feathers. In good light, the plumage looks very rich, golden yellow on the breast, and the general pattern is like a huge aquatic warbler. Although this bird showed well at times along the coastal track, it could be elusive when it disappeared into the adjacent set-aside field. News of a snowy egret photographed in Argyle had hundreds of birders making the long haul north over the next few days. Fortunately, the bird remained faithful to its chosen pools throughout most of November, resulting in more than 2,000 birders making the journey. This species is expanding its range up the east coast of North America, making vagrancy here more likely. But this is the first record for Britain and Europe. The most obvious identification feature is the colour of the bare skin between the bill and the eye. In this species it is yellow, whereas in little egret it is blue-grey. Also the leg colour differs from little egret in being mainly greenish yellow, with the black being restricted to the front of the tarsus and tibia. This bird was not at all shy and regularly came within 20 feet of watching birders as it scoured the shallow pools opposite Balvicar post office. This bird was judged to be a first winter by the relative lack of black on the legs and the pale base to the lower mandible. This would also agree with the statistics which show that most long distance vagrants occurring in the autumn are in fact first winter birds. After disappearing from Balvicar on the 25th of November, 
It resurfaced further south on the Ayrshire coast on the 22nd of December. Who knows, it may even make it to England in 2002. This immature male, Snowy Owl, was first seen in Felixstowe docks on the 24th of October. It was badly oiled and was assumed to be one of several which had been ship assisted to Europe from Canada. In spite of its poor plumage condition, it was still capable of catching a rat, a black-headed gull and two partridges in the container compounds. Initially, this bird was often only visible at long range, but it eventually moved to waste ground on the eastern edge of the dock's compound, making it visible from the seawall at Trimley Marsh's nature reserve. It spent most of the day sitting on the ground watching for prey and only occasionally flying to a new lookout position. This bird remained in this area until early December before moving further afield. This drake by called Teal was first seen at Minsmere on the 18th of November 
and remained until at least late December. The species was taken off the British list in 1993 because it was suspected that all the records could refer to escapes from captivity. The hopes for this bird rest on it being a first winter and the species being difficult to breed in captivity. This is not entirely straightforward however since this bird could be just a late molting adult rather than a first winter. The drake is a very attractive bird and many people travelled great distances to see this bird, even if most considered it as only an insurance tick. This winter saw an unprecedented number of ivory gulls recorded in Britain and Ireland. Unusually, of the five or six records, most were adults, like this bird at Black Rock Sands. This was by far the longest staying individual being present from the 9th to the 26th of February. This protracted stay was no doubt associated with the porpoise carcass on which it fed for two weeks. Indeed the bird may have arrived with the carcass as it is said that they will often follow a floating food source.
This species is one of the most sought after on the British list. It has always been very rare and irregular, with adult birds being the rarest of all. Ivory gull is rare outside the Arctic Circle, even in winter. In late March, the southwest had something of a purple patch, with Scops owl, alpine swifts, little bitten, and this fine male black-eared wheat ear. Unlike the others, this bird was destined to be a long stayer on the ploughed fields between Nanquidno and St Just. First seen on the 23rd of March, it remained in the area for 10 days, making it one of the longest stayers ever of this extreme rarity. It was considered to be the western race, which is normally a summer visitor to Iberia. Both eastern and western races can be either black-throated or pale-throated. In spite of several recent records, this remains one of the rarest wheat ears to be seen in Britain. On the 11th of May, a sand plover was found on the Lincolnshire coast at Rymac. By lunchtime the next day, the majority of observers were sure that the bird was a lesser sand plover.
first impressions were of a sand plover which lacked the extra long bill and legs of a grater. This was the first twitchable bird to be seen in Britain, since the 1997 record was only positively identified from photographs after it had gone. This bird was more obliging, staying for five days and generally giving good views, although the heat haze could be quite bad on the beach. It was thought to be a first summer female, but may even have been an adult female. Being a female it was impossible to assign it to any particular race, although the Atrifons group would seem to be the most likely. When retaliating against an aggressive winged plover, the bird shows its white wing bar, which is broader on the primaries, and the tail is seen to lack any dark subterminal band. Although first seen on the 13th of May, this first summer male, Lesser Kestrel, was not conclusively identified until the 15th. From then on, hundreds of birders visited the Isles of Scilly to see this real mega rarity. Fortunately, it stayed for nearly two weeks and usually showed very well, either at the golf course or on the end of Peninis.
These sequences were all taken on Paninis. The bird would hang on the wind above the high tide line, dropping to pick beetles from the turf below, and then carrying them aloft to eat on the wing. Compared to Kestrel, this bird looked more compact, with shorter tail and faster, shallower wing beats. The hardest diagnostic feature to see is the pale claws, but I did not get sufficiently close views when the bird briefly perched on rocks. Note the long central tail feather, the pale underwings, the unspotted mantle and scapulars, the blue-grey head and the lack of dark moustachial streaks. There have only been six accepted records of this species since 1926. None of them was really twitchable, so this was a first for almost everyone. This molting adult elegant turn appeared at Dawlish Warren on the 8th of July and was presumably the same bird seen here in May. It was certainly not the orange-billed tern seen in Norfolk on the 20th of June. Notice the pale patch on the nape, the white forehead and the white rump and tail. With further records at Dawlish on the 18th to the 21st of July and then at Porth Maddock from the 23rd to the 26th, one wonders whether more than one bird might be involved. These shots were all recorded during heavy rain from the hide at Dawlish Warren. The first proven record of Orduin's gull in Britain became a reality when this second summer bird stayed for three days at Dunge Ness.
Although one of the world's rarest gulls, only breeding in the Mediterranean area, the population has increased significantly in recent years to more than 6,000 pairs. This is bound to increase its vagrancy potential, even though it is still very rare away from the Mediterranean. Note the heavy red bill with black subterminal band and pale tip, the long sloping forehead and when visible the blackish legs. In flight, notice the thin black bar on the secondaries and the narrow black subterminal band on the tail. This is the typical second summer plumage of this species. By its third summer, this bird will look almost like an adult, with mainly grey upper wings and a wholly white tail. This bird ranged up and down the beach, from the beached boats up to the patch but was also seen on the RSPB lagoons. Indeed, this bird was initially identified on the lagoons by the RSPB warden. Here the bird is resting on the beach at the patch. Notice the small size compared to the herring gulls. Because this species feeds almost exclusively on fish and does not scavenge like most gulls, it is naturally confined to coastal areas.
probably the most unexpected bird of the year, this male blacklark was identified late on Sunday the 1st of June. Very few people managed to get to South Stack that day, resulting in the biggest twitch of the year the next morning. Fortunately the bird was still present and remained for a week feeding above the cliffs on the burnt off area. This area had been cleared of gorse in order to make it more suitable for feeding chuffs. The black lark is only found on the Central Asian steppes of Kazakhstan and is a very rare vagrant to Europe. If accepted, this bird will constitute the first British record. The only previous claims for Britain concern the now discredited Hastings rarities. In this scam, several dead birds were claimed to have been shot in the Hastings area of Sussex in the early part of the 20th century. The motive was that collectors would pay a high price for rare birds shot in Britain. This bird is in full summer plumage. Winter plumage is typified by many pale feather edges which gradually wear away to reveal the mainly black summer plumage. Note how this bird could easily have been overlooked. A first quick glance would suggest a starling and both its feeding method and flight would fit in with this erroneous assumption. Notice the large size of this bird compared to the accompanying pipit. Indeed this is one of the largest larks ever to be found in Europe. The black lark is more widespread on the steppes of Kazakhstan than that other speciality, the white winged lark. Although that species has occurred in Britain, it is still at the top of every twitcher's wanted list. News of an American robin in Cornwall was welcome news for many after a very frustrating bird on Bardsey Island in early November. Because of bad weather very few people managed to get to Bardsey before that bird had flown. This first winter female was much more available at Godrevy Point from mid-December. It frequented a cattle feeding area amongst the dunes, feeding on the ground in blackbird-like fashion. 
Indeed, this species is often said to be the North American counterpart of our blackbird, feeding on lawns and in paddocks. It is a similar size to the blackbird and first winter birds show pale spots on the tips of the greater coverts, similar to other first winter thrushes. Males are grey backed with more black on the head, so this brown backed bird would be a female. Apart from a short staying bird on St Agnes in October 1998, this was the first twitchable bird since the first winter male at Inverbervie, Scotland in December 1988. December is obviously a good month for finding this mega on the mainland. This year's records of American Robin in Britain were preceded by extremely high numbers migrating down the east coast of America in the autumn.
Yet another American Robin was found on the 1st of January by birders looking for some reported wax wings. This bird frequented trees and hawthorn bushes on an industrial estate at Piewipe on the northwest side of Grimsby. It was quite oblivious to the busy traffic as well as the large crowd of birders and fed either on the ground or on various types of berries. Typically, for a transatlantic vagrant, it was a first winter bird, still showing traces of the spotted juvenile plumage on its breast. Notice the white tips to the outer tail feathers, shown well here. Although this bird remained for over two months in this area, its tame and confiding nature was its final downfall. On the 8th of March it was taken by a sparrowhawk, witnessed by a small group of birders. The Baltimore Oriole remained in Headington during January 2004, often visiting feeders in a garden where access had been arranged. It fed on oranges and peanuts, giving good close views as it did so. This was quite a contrast to the initial difficulty of seeing this bird when it was first discovered in December 2003, making a second visit well worthwhile. However, the bird also roamed around many other gardens, often necessitating a long wait before it returned to the accessible one. Close views of this bird suggested that it was indeed a first winter male. With the regular supply of food it was thought that this bird may overwinter in these gardens. It was not to be. The bird disappeared in mid-January. 
Hopefully, it was not eaten by one of the many cats prowling the gardens. A male pine bunting was found on the 28th of February, feeding on spilt grain at Chosley Drying Barns in Norfolk. At first, this bird was rather elusive, only visiting the drying barns at long intervals. But on my visit on the 1st of March, it spent most of the day feeding at this site. Oops, gone. It was still very flighty, regularly flying into the hedges with the yellow hammers. This bird attracted a large crowd, as many years have passed since the last twitchable bird was seen at Gibraltar Point in Lincolnshire. Amazingly, for such a rare vagrant, this was the sixth time I have filmed this species in Britain. Most recent records have been of birds in winter often at winter feeding stations. This begs the question of when do they arrive in Britain? They don't seem to be picked up at the coastal watch points. This individual, although still elusive, was seen on and off up to the 11th of March. This drake buffle head caused quite a stir when it was found on the outskirts of Manchester in early April. It quickly moved on to Pugney's Country Park near Wakefield, where it favoured the Nature Reserve Lake until the 22nd of April. Notice this duck's small size in comparison with the black-headed gulls. Although said to be unringed, it is difficult to prove a non-captive origin, but the timing at least is consistent with other recent records.
This bird was originally thought to be a juvenile woodchat shrike, a very rare bird for mainland Scotland. Doubt set in when it was realised that it had a dark rump, whereas woodchat should have a whitish rump. It was soon realised that this was a real mega rarity, the first acceptable record of mass shrike for Britain. The only other records related to the now discredited Hastings rarities, claimed at the beginning of the 20th century. Fortunately, the bird remained for 17 days at Kilrenny, enabling most birders to see it, and it showed very well. As well as the dark rump, also note the smaller, weaker bill, compared to a woodchat. It also has a longer, thinner tail, and lacks the brown tones of a juvenile woodchat. Another notable feature is the large white patch at the base of the primaries. The bird fed in typical shrike fashion, often returning to the same perch. It seemed to be catching plenty of flying insects. This bird appears to have lost some of its left hand side tail feathers, so the white tail side is only shown on its right hand side. 